Welcome everyone to the very first live recording of the Raising Joy podcast here downtown Cowtown Isis Theater right here in Fort Worth, Texas in the historical stockyards. to say um, thank you for a honest, hard look of what it is like um, to go through depression or to support someone who is chronically depressed or suicidal. Thank you for using your voice and your talent and your knowledge to raise awareness about that. As a psychiatrist, I can't say thank you enough um, for bringing this conversation to our community. And I wanted to say thank you also to the audience for you know, sitting through the hard stuff. I know that that wasn't easy to hear, um, but it is the things that we talk about in my office all day, every day. So um, I, I really do appreciate you guys for being here So, um, and being willing to have the hard conversations. And it is ugly. Thank you. Thank you. So help me understand how you got to this place of writing about suicide, attempted suicide. How did you get to that point? I had a very bad depression myself, a couple of bad depressions in my early 30s, mm-hmm. and I wrote a book about depression, and so I uh, had looked at it, but I didn't really understand very much about suicide. I'd known a few people because of the research I was doing who'd made attempts. And then there was this young man in my, or this boy really, um, whom my son knew, um, and whom I talked about in the talk, and when he died, his parents were trying to figure out what to do and where to go. And even though I hadn't been super close to them before, I called them and said, look, if anything that I've done or any, you know, if I can introduce you to anyone who can help you to process this and so on and so forth. And then his parents were so compelling. I mean, the stories were very condensed, even though they may have seemed interminable, but right. they, were, they were very condensed. But his parents, his mother in particular, was so compelling and so brilliantly articulate. And I felt like, something had to happen with the anguish that she had. And she said to me, will you write about this? She said, nobody knows anything about it. We were lost. And then I started working on an article and I called my, the editor of The New Yorker where I write and he said, okay, he said, but I don't want this to be a story about children of privilege and what a rough time they have. He said, go out into the world and try to find out what's going on with all kinds of people. And so that was what I did. I went and started talking to people. And the more I talked to people, the more I thought, this is everywhere. And no one knows what to do. I mean, aside from the sort of basic, bring your child to the emergency room, no one has any idea what to do. And I felt even though it's obviously a grisly topic and it is not fun to sit and write about, I thought I'd better try to write something. How did these stories impact you personally, though? Oh, the stories are tough. Um, I mean... You know, most of these people I've interviewed multiple times over a period of time. I've come to feel close to them in one way or another. Um, Sometimes I feel like I get to the point where I'm working on statistics and I think, okay, so this source said 10% and that source said 20% and which one is more reliable? And then I suddenly think, those are actually dead children on the floor somewhere. And I get overwhelmed by it again. And the actual encounters with these families 
you know, they're very brave. And I've said to people, which I haven't necessarily said with everything else I've written, I have not worked to persuade anyone to talk to me. I've said to everyone, if you would like to talk about this, I would love to hear what you have to say and I will write about it. I said, if you don't want to talk about it, then don't. Um, and it's been, a, it's been an education. Absolutely. So I first encountered your work in the New Yorker article, Unthinkable, and I was just struck. I, well, I have a confession. I didn't understand that you were a psychologist. <laughs> I didn't know that he was Dr. Andrew Solomon. And I read the article and I, I was like, how does this writer understand the scope of the problem? And then all of the complexity, which you touched on or that we talked about today with the bullying, the social media, the differences in the minority groups and how it affects the LGBTQ community, like all of those things. I was like, wow, he really gets it. And so it was very refreshing to me. What I was struck by is one, Jamie reminds me of so many of my patients, as does Seven. I don't, I don't have a patient with his specific um, issue, but the way that the medical complexity um, impacts your mental health, yes. very much a part of my world. But I was just struck by, you know, that you got the topic and, um, but I was just curious, um, how is Jamie's family doing now? Like, how are they doing? So I haven't been so much in touch with Jamie's okay. family um, recently. Um, I mean, I think they have carried themselves with enormous dignity and I think that they are doing as well as it's possible to do, but I think they're you know, one is damaged after this. I mean, when I wrote about depression, I could have a sort of cheery little thing at the end that said, you know, you never would have wanted to be depressed, but actually you can learn a lot from it. And when I wrote about um, disability and difference, I could say, well, nobody would choose to have a disabled child. Actually, having one broadens your understanding of humanity. There isn't a hidden upside here. There is nobody who says, oh, actually, I'm really glad that this happened to my child or that my child did this, however it is that it's phrased. So. The feeling that I've had is, you know, of course, there will never be any recovery, but they are bravely going on, and especially because Jamie had a younger sister, and the parents have had to keep going so that they can take care of that girl and make sure that she comes out as intact as possible. I can't imagine that there isn't a person who's sitting out here who will listen to you and who is a parent that didn't hear some of those stories and think back to their own lives and their own children. What am I missing? Is there something I need to talk about? Is there something I need to see? What One of the things that really got me is saying that talking about suicide does not cause suicide. Do you, um, and do you encourage parents to have the conversation about suicide to their own children, because it, it is scary. I don't want to talk about it because I don't want them thinking about it, and I don't want them thinking about it. I don't want them to do it. Right. Well, um, I should say that I have children who are in the general age bracket that I'm looking at, and that the process of doing this research has been the scariest thing that I've ever done, because, of course, it fills you with terror of what could happen to you. Um, it's a matter of understanding how to talk to them about it, when to talk to them about it, what do you say to little kids, what do you say to bigger kids, what do you say to a kid who you think might be suicidal, what do you say to a kid you just want to help to understand. Yes, it's very important to talk about it because the burden of secrecy is frequently the last straw that breaks the camel's back and you have to free them from that. But you don't want to sort of sit down and talk about it every night at dinner. Yeah. And I try to not do that with my own kids, even if it's what I've been doing all day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is hard to turn it off. You know, it's not like there's some switch. I would love to pretend that there is, but there just really isn't. Um, so I know that the article Unthinkable is getting expanded into a book that you're writing now. Um, when will the book be released? I promised to turn it in next December, so December of 23, and it will come out sometime in 24. Okay. What would you say is the number one, and I know that there's a lot of stuff, but what would be one of the number one things you would point to that says that really does cause youth suicide or attempts? 
Well, I think that the cause that's most around us right now is social media. I mean, I talked about it a good bit in the talk, but I really think that the danger of social media, and I think parents often, and I include myself in this category, don't recognize how dangerous it can be because for some people it isn't dangerous at all. But as somebody said to me when we were talking about this, they said, okay, some people really enjoy it, and for other people it drives them, if not to suicide, which is mostly what I was talking about, but it drives a lot of people into depression. They have shown that um, if you measure in adolescent girls the experience of being on Instagram, that if you have an adolescent girl, no matter who she is or how popular she is, by the end of 10 minutes on Instagram, she registers as having lower self-confidence than she did when she started. So I think that's a really serious problem. And as someone said to me, you know, the fact that some people are having a good time is not a good excuse for something that's killing other people. And I think it could be managed and regulated. It's not that I think we should get rid of social media or that I think we could get rid of social media. But there could be more information for parents. There could be more information for kids. These algorithms could be changed. Steering people toward suicide information could be altered. Steering people toward all kinds of other neuroses could be uh, brought under control. It's just it's a, an out of control situation right now and it needs some regulation. I think especially for young people because their brains don't recognize that the picture that they see is a small fraction that is edited and filtered and all of those things. They think, oh, this is the life that they have all the time. We all know, like we all have that objective sense because of brain development to know that that's not actually reality. Like this is a carefully curated image, but um, teenagers just don't get it. And so I think, and then also whenever you said that the bullying continues, I think that that also plays a huge role, um, you know, in, in teenagers' mental health because whenever, if you wanted to say something to someone whenever I was growing up, you had to say it to their face. But now you can type it or you can text it and, and it takes a lot less courage. So um, I think that the role of social media is huge for teenagers. And, and one doctor I was talking to recently, I said to him in this context, I said, you know, there also used to be the fact, I said, you could get away from the people who bullied you. I said, you also got away from the daily news. You know, you read the mm -hmm. newspaper in the morning, you watched it on TV at six o'clock, that was it. It wasn't sort of constantly pinging into your phone. I said, between the people they're at school with and the information from outside, I said, the world is just constantly intruding into their lives. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, it isn't. He said a simulacrum of the world is intruding. He mm -hmm. said if the world were intruding, they might be able to handle it. He said, but you can't fight or do anything about a simulacrum. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you talk about bullying, um, the thing that struck me when you said the bully, mm -hmm. the perpetrator is sometimes the person who commits suicide. And I mm -hmm. think that, you know, we've done this a long time and that's the first time I've ever, It's both. You know, Okay, see, that's the first time I'd ever heard that, is that I know the person who is being bullied, but the perpetrator. But actually, when you sort of get into it, if you talk to people who are bullies, um, and I use, you know, that's a, a word with a lot of wide meanings, but people who are bullies are not very happy people, you know? You somehow think they're the ones with all the power, but actually, mostly people don't like them. Maybe people are afraid of them and play up to them, but people don't like them. Um, they don't know what really to do most of the time with the power they have. I mean, there's a lot of stress and tension around bullying. So I had never known it either until I started doing this work. But once I started thinking about it, it actually makes sense. We have a question from the audience. Um, an audience member wants to know, can you talk about compassion fatigue, how to preserve oneself while doing the work with adolescents or being a parent going through it? Great question. It is a really great question. And I would just start by saying it's really, really hard to do. And, you know, when I think about that in particular, um, about the uh, girl Frida who I talked about, whose mother has had to make a kind of situation at home where Frida has to take off all her clothes. And I couldn't go into all the details of what I said, but her mother was in the middle of getting a college degree. She's worked as a sort of administrative assistant. They are not people with huge advantages and she's had to give it all up so that she can try to deal with this situation. And I said to her, how, how on earth do you deal with it? And she said, she said, I hate to say it, she said, but I don't ever want her to go into a hospital. But when she's in a hospital and someone else is taking care of it, I can breathe again. Um, and so 
I think the, the fatigue is very real. It's real for people in the field, and it's very real for parents. I mean, people in the field mostly have some training, and they have some information, and they have some other things. And also, people in the field mostly, when they go home, are dealing with whatever their own issues are, but aren't dealing with their patients' issues. Right. Um, but for parents who have got children who are in this situation, you know, what you have to, and especially because some of these children, I mean, you heard some of the stuff Frida said, they can be rude and mean and abusive. It's so hard to go on being kind to them. And yet it's, you have to keep reminding yourself, they aren't doing it deliberately. This is who they are for whatever the reasons may be. But, you know, in general anyway, I mean, some people are, are sociopathic and are deliberately awful and so on, but the children who are, uh, whom I've been talking about, they aren't doing it deliberately. They can't help themselves. We have a saying on our, in our department, kids do well if they can, but. Perfect, yes. yeah. How do we bring more attention to the fact that there are now so many black and brown children who are experiencing this and at such early age between 5 and 12 I'm 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 dumbstruck how do we bring more attention to something like that I think it would be great to bring attention sort of from two directions, one of which is from the people who are not black and brown, who need to be aware of what the real costs are of um, racism and of the subtle ways. I mean, I think there are complexities around some of the rhetoric that has um, spun out um, in the last few years um, about um, what constitutes or doesn't constitute a microaggression in certain kinds of climates. But I think people don't realize for example, that a black child who's having trouble is much more likely to be put on medication with no therapy yep. than a white child who's yep. having trouble. You yep. know, that there's all of this racism built into the system. It's yep. so pervasive um, and it's, you know, it's evil. It's the, it's the sort of atrocity of, um, of our country. And then from the black side, I think there has been a cultural resistance, which is probably a legacy of enduring slavery yes. to admitting vulnerability and weakness, and especially to admitting it broadly. Yes. And when I was talking to Tammy, she said to me, I have to be honest with you. She said right at the beginning, she said, I don't really like white people coming and snooping through my business, yes. but I know if I don't talk to people like you that nothing's ever going to happen, so I'm going to do it anyway. And I think if Black Lives Matter and the other powerful organizations, whatever they are, the NAACP, are willing to acknowledge that this is a crisis in black America, that there's a great deal that could be accomplished. So it has to come in both directions. Right. Thank you. Well, okay. What is the one thing you think people don't know but should when it comes to youth suicides? The things that people have been most shocked by are how many of them there are and how young the kids are. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I think people really don't know is that in a lot of cases, the kids who end their lives have not previously had a diagnosable depression. People think, oh, that depressed kid, well, we have to take care of it. You have, to, you have a kid who's not depressed, you have to know this is a risk, and you have to try to protect against it, and you have to ask that kid how they're feeling and really try to ask, and you have to understand, all I just think you have to, you have to you have to delve into your kids and not accept that they seem wonderful because some kids who seem wonderful are wonderful, but a lot of kids who seem wonderful are struggling. Even if they're not suicidal, they're struggling more than they want to let on and recognize that they have a sense of pride and they also have a wish to protect you as parents. And between those two things, a lot of stuff gets covered up. I mean, I had as part of this speech, and I left it out because it was going a little long, but um, the fact that when I was little, I think I really could hardly have been closer to my parents. I adored my parents, they adored me, we had a wonderful relationship. They didn't know that I was gay. They didn't know I was gay until I was 23 years old. Mm -hmm. I carried that secret with me. It was the most enormous secret. It's in some ways the central defining part of me. If I could carry that secret all that time in the way that so many other kids have carried that particular secret, it gives you a window into what it must be like to carry this other secret, this worst secret, this terrible secret that we've been talking about. Right. This has been so hard. It is. It it's is a tough so conversation. Hard. It is. Mm -hmm. 
Is there hope in here? Is there hope in the room? Just, I, I need some hope <laughs> in the room, please. Let's do that. I need a, uh, from one of y'all, I don't know. <laughs> Somebody, raise your hand for some hope. I, I, I need a little hope. Well, I think the reality is that lots of kids get through this. Most kids who make attempts don't end up dying by suicide. Most kids who make attempts are not successful, and most of the ones who've made attempts get better. I think that's where the hope is. And I think the really big hope is if we worked on having hospitals and teachers and government agencies and everyone else put their resources into this, I think we could eliminate at least half the child suicides in this country, and I think we could do it fast. Okay, I have one more question. Okay. Um, from the audience, <laughs> I don't wanna leave this. Um, you mentioned middle school, in middle school, that it is the time of the moody teen. Um, how do you distinguish from it uh, just a kid being moody and something to be concerned about that they may harm themselves? So, you know, we all have that. That's a good question. I want to know. Uh, it's a great question. And uh, having been a moody teen and having been father to moody teens, <laughs> I feel well qualified to respond. I mean, the fact is that you don't know. Yeah. So what you have to do is take it seriously if you think your child is struggling and really be attuned to it. On the other hand, if your child is just having a normal difficult time because eighth grade is not usually the best part of anyone's life, yeah. Um, yeah. and you're there the whole time saying, but, but I'm worried and I'm worried you might kill yourself and we have to get another therapist and whatever, you know, you can layer it on in ways that are actually, will cause your child to think, I guess I am completely crazy and that will be damaging. It's so hard to get the balance right. But I think the real answer, if I had to answer in a word, which as you can tell, I seldom do, the one word answer is listen. I totally agree. Thank you so much for bringing this conversation to our community. Absolutely. It is hard. Thank you, audience, for not looking away. Yeah. I know it's been hard, but thank you all. Yeah. If you're not already a subscriber to the Raising Joy podcast, check it out on iTunes, Spotify, and all your major podcast platforms and help spread that awareness.